you know, we often throw around words like legends and icons and pillar of an industry or a sport way too liberally, way too loosely, because not everybody deserves that label. But when you think about Kanji Inoki, or later on Muhammad Hussein Inoki, or as we all came to know him as over the decades by his ring name, Antonio Inoki, it's not an overreaction, it's not hyperbole to refer to this man as a legend of the professional wrestling industry, a legend of the professional wrestling game because he was absolutely all of that and more. Absolutely. He is one of the biggest names in the history of professional wrestling. And I know that could be a pretty wide swath and a pretty large bucket that could have a lot of names in there. Uh, but Antonio Inoki certainly falls into that category. So with the news coming out uh, here in the States at least, uh, late on September 30th of his passing at the age of 79, like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. Like, even for a man that was 79 years of age and, you know, had stepped back from the New Japan scene for years and, you know, and it still feels like a big deal. It still feels like a big loss because so many of us uh, know Inoki, his face, his name for one reason or another, you know. Uh, and when you look back at the Antonio Inoki story, it is an interesting one. Here's a man that uh, was born during, like if you think about this, he was born during the height of World War II in Japan. And as a result, grew up in post-World War II Japan. So even though his father was like a businessman and a politician, uh, they certainly experienced some struggles. And in fact, I believe at one point when he was a teenager, they ended up moving to Brazil. He lost his dad when he was only a few years old and lost one of his grandparents you know, on the trip to actually go to Brazil. And so this is a man that had to deal with a lot early on in his life and you know, eventually got to a spot where he was fortunate enough to be able to meet uh, wrestling icon Ricky Dojan at the age of 17. And when you think about Ricky Dojan, you know, this is a guy that a lot of people hear the name and know the name, but they don't quite appreciate like just how massive of a deal he is. This was a guy that was at the peak of his powers in the 50s and the early 60s in the wrestling scene. And he was absolutely a gigantic monster star. And Antonio Inoki was one of the prized pupils, if you will, under Ricky Dojan. He ended up going uh, with Ricky Dojan and to Japan, going back home, if you will, to wrestle under the Japan Pro Wrestling Alliance. And that's where he first met another icon of Japanese and, frankly, just the world's professional wrestling scene, the man we would know as Giant Baba. And when you think about how important professional wrestling is to the Japanese culture, they did some poll, I think it was back in like 2005, 2006. Somebody could fact check me on this. And while this is not a statement about Anoki, it's more about Giant Baba. But they asked Japanese, the Japanese people, your 100 favorite historical figures of all time. So of course, there are all types of, you know, samurais and shogun leaders and so forth throughout the history. And it encapsulated the world. So Princess Diana was pretty high on the list. But at 91, one slot above Abraham Lincoln was Giant Baba. That's how much professional wrestling melt meant, means, meant, still means to the people of Japan. It is a big part of their entertainment and sporting culture. And guys like Giant Baba and guys like Antonio Inoki were absolutely monstrous players in that becoming so. Whereas Ricky Dojin and others kind of laid the foundation, it was these guys that first as a tag team in the 60s and the early 70s, you know, made Japanese wrestling a big deal, continued to build it to be a big thing. And then they, when they kind of split off and did their own thing as the Japan Pro Wrestling Alliance kind of went away and folded. You know, it was Antonio Inoki who started New Japan and it was Giant Baba that started All Japan. And you think about 
Antonio Inoki, you know, he was, I guess you'd say, discovered or learned under Rikidojin, trained by Carl Gott. So that's how far back we go. The legendary names that were involved here. And all Antonio Inoki did was become a big, massive star. And we talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling. There are a lot of you watching this video, a lot of you that watch professional wrestling today that love New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's been around for 50 years now. And it probably wouldn't be there without Antonio Inoki. Like, so when you want to talk about major impacts, it's a pretty big damn deal. And when you look at some of the career highlights, and I could go on and on and on, you know, when you talk about individual matches, individual moments with Antonio Inoki, you want to talk about some matches going wrong in terms of turning into shoots. Like, you look at Antonio Inoki, here's a guy that he would do the gimmicks and stuff. Like, he, he understood what wrestling was and what it was supposed to be. But that was a guy you could look at and you 100% took seriously. Like, you knew Antonio Inoki was legit. You know what I mean? He was a legit shooter. You cross him, he could mess you the hell up. And there's something you really got to respect about wrestlers like that. They could do the performance dance, they could do the entertainment, but don't get it twisted. If you cross them, they will mess you up. That was something I always looked at it with Antonio Inoki, going back and watching his old matches, and just the way the man's presence, his charisma, like you could just tell this was a guy that could be very congenial, very nice, but don't cross the boss kind of deal. Uh, but a lot of people really became familiar with him when he had the uh, exhibition bout with Muhammad Ali in June of 1976. While it certainly wasn't the greatest of successes in terms of an entertaining show, when it was kind of an early um, failure and kind of like the closed circuit pay-per-view kind of business model, it was a really big deal. And there's a reason that uh, Muhammad Ali was willing to do this with somebody like Antonio Inoki in Japan because Antonio Inoki was that big of a deal. Even when you look at late 1979, even though this title reign has never been announced, or excuse me, have been recognized by the WWF, WWE now, he did beat Bob Becklin for the WWF Championship in 1979. Like that speaks to the working relationship that Antonio Inoki um, had with Vince McMahon Sr. and then later on Jr. for years. It speaks to the respect that this man had, that if they would even allow him to do that, they would entertain that. I mean, that's, that's not a small deal. Like Backlund carried that strap for a number of years in a row. And at one point in time, even though it's never officially been recognized, Antonio Inoki was the guy to end that. And then you think about uh, that two-night collision in Korea, North Korea event, where Antonio Inoki helped headline it and helped promote it. And, you know, they put 150,000 people in that North Korean stadium in night one. And then in night two, it was 190,000 people. And Antonio Inoki faced Ric Flair for the only time in his career. You know, you could say whatever you want about the event being in North Korea and how they got the people to get there. But just think about the sheer optics of Antonio Inoki is the featured act in a show that draws almost 200,000 people to watch wrestling. That's insane. He made Japan, it helped make it Japan, because it certainly wasn't just him, obviously. But he was one of those guys that helped make Japan a must, must go to destination for professional wrestlers all around the world. Like, think about how many wrestlers over the decades have went to Japan, and even in some cases, they achieved a certain level of success here in the States, but they go to Japan and experience the height of their popularity and their drawing power and their star power. It comes in Japan. And Antonio Inoki was a big part of that. Then you even think about his impact outside of the wrestling ring and get into his two stints in the House of Counselors, which is basically... Um, you think about Congress in the States, that's what it's patterned off of in Japan. He even had his own, what was it, sports and peace party when he ran the first time in 1989. He got elected, served six years then, then came back later and ran a second, second stint. Like that speaks to the presence that a man like Antonio Inoki had. And then when you also think about the impact that he had on the business. Look at some of the guys that he trained. It's not just what you can do, it's what, what you contribute to the business. He trained guys like Fujinami, the great Muda, Hashimoto, Chono, 
Shinsuke Nakamura, like I could go on and on and on. Those are just some of the guys. I couldn't go through all the guys that you could point to Inoki being a trainer for. And you say, okay, it's one thing that you're great yourself in a massive star in drawing power, and he absolutely was. That's what Antonio Inoki was. He was a massive star. Not just in Japan, but around the world. But the fact that he helped develop those next generations of guys that could go on themselves to be big stars like speaks to the man's greatness and his impact and his legacy on the business. And I saw somebody post on Twitter earlier today and I thought it was outstanding. And I'm like, this to be just for a lot of reasons, just represents Antonio Inoki. They're talking about event. What was it like 20 years ago? Uh, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the style of new Japan pro wrestling, the strong style. Like it's not really my bag and that's cool. It doesn't have to be. It's not for everybody. Um, but it was some event, like back in 2000, 2001, something like that. And Antonio Inoki's just sitting there, standing in the middle of the ring. And you got a bunch of young men that are lined up on the ramp. And all they're doing is they're waiting to get the shit smacked out of them by Antonio Inoki. Like they're literally coming in the ring and he's just slapping the hell out of them. One by one by one by one. And I say, you know what? That represents how much of a badass he was. Because people would take that kind of slap line and think that this is legit and feel this is legit because they know Antonio Inoki was legit. Imagine sitting there and paying and watching something like this. But that speaks to, again, the drawing power, the star power, and the respect that Antonio Inoki had with the Japanese people. And think about how much you probably wish you could be in that line. Imagine being able to tell the story of, yeah, I was one of the dudes that got the, piss, the, the taste slapped out of my mouth by Antonio Inoki. I got just so many ways. It was just so cool and so awesome. And to me, just represents Antonio Inoki and his career and his legacy. But yeah, certainly sad news to hear about the passing of not just a Japanese wrestling icon or an Asian wrestling icon, but really an international wrestling icon. Like as a performer in the ring, as a promoter, like there is no question the professional wrestling business is infinitely better off for Antonio Inoki having been in it. There is no question that he is one of the biggest names in terms of overall career, overall impact, overall legacy. Antonio Inoki is beyond question one of the biggest names in the history of professional wrestling. And he will be remembered as such.